Do you ever feel like you were born in the wrong time? Like, modern life is just a bit too fast-paced? Perhaps you strongly feel like you should have been born, let's say, uh, 15th century, yeah. And maybe in what is modern-day Slovakia, but in the 15th century might have been incorporated into the Hungarian Empire and called Belvidek? And you're a big fan of chivalry, so of course you're gonna be a knight, right? And, and, you can't decide if Hylix is your favorite game because of its exploration into Gnostic lore and psychology, or if Fear and Hunger better explores the human condition, with its grim and frankly offensive portrayal of the human species. Well, my friends with very specific tastes and fantasies, I'm excited to offer you a little indie RPG title called Belvedere. Let's take a look. Felvedek is what you might call a historical fantasy JRPG. It's made an RPG maker, but I'm just beyond the point where I complain about that anymore. It is apparently my destiny to continually be interested in games that are developed with RPG maker, but also to hate RPG maker with a burning passion. You know what? It's whatever. I've made my peace with it. You play as an alcoholic knight, suffering from intense depression brought about by his wife leaving him. Fortunately, a castle in the distance explodes, as they so often do, and gives him a little purpose. He's gotta go protect it. And that's pretty much the setup. So like I mentioned earlier, in this game you play in a pretty specific place in time. A place in time that I know nothing, absolutely nothing about. So to be honest, I could have been fooled here, but the game feels very authentically inserted into this historical setting. Characters are constantly mentioning real life events, rulers, places, people, etc. Now, the only reason I'm able to even pick out the things they're mentioning is real, as opposed to something fictional for the narrative, is because I played this other game called Kingdom Come Deliverance that was set in a somewhat similar time period, and that game kind of forced me to learn a little bit of history. So when this game name drops Jan Hus, I have a vague understanding of the significance of that. Okay, we're, we're getting off track here. I'll come back to this in a second. Okay, so the main character for this Oostjurpig, that's Eastern European-style Japanese role-playing game, a handy little acronym I made up to celebrate the birth of a genre. Anyway, our main character is Pavel, a depressed alcoholic knight awakened from his binge drinking by an actual problem. Luckily, his knighting instincts kick in and he goes to the lord of the castle to figure out what to do. Now, I say lord because they were doing a feudalism back then. I, uh, I assume. I, I'm not an expert. You know what, maybe I shouldn't have said anything in the first place. Okay, he's a lord because he has very fancy clothes. So by those rules, you now have to do what I say. Can you guess? That's right, like, comment, and subscribe. You have to do it. It's the law. Okay, so the Lord of the Castle says you have to take a holy man with you on your investigation. This monk, Mat Matej. Matej. Matej? Okay. So these two, Pavel and Matej, form the basis of your party for the rest of the game. This is a JRPG, remember, so we've got a little party that follows us around. All right, time to start the adventure at large. So, like many RPG Maker games, we're in sort of a top-down isometric kind of view. So let's go explore. We can wander around the castle a bit and get acquainted with things. You can press the interact button to interact with objects, people, or in the environment. Pretty standard in these types of games. And you can run. Now, I always love seeing what kind of run animations they cook up in RPG Maker games. And this game is no slouch. Look at him go. Alright, so at this point you've probably noticed the visuals. This game has an extraordinarily bleak color palette and just an overall somber tone. But, I don't think it can be denied that the game is gorgeous. It's a strange mix of what I think are traditional illustrations with some bit-crunching pixel magic going on. During the battles, which I'll talk about later, it looks like there was some rotoscoping done with the animations to play when you take an action. These animations are all very crispy and fit in great with the rest of the game. Also, the game has some cinematics sprinkled throughout here and there that are rendered in a very PS1 style, with simple 3D models and dithered textures. Everything in this game looks distinctive and beautiful in its own way, from the castle, which I adore, to the many different character portraits. There's less emphasis on cohesion when it comes to the character portraits, since some appear to be modeled after real humans, and others mere illustrations. And I think, in another game, this fact might bother me, but this game is definitely on the quirkier side, so I'll just let it slide. I think this game does borrow visually from some established titles in the genre. 
but at the same time, it carves out its own space in the niche. We haven't talked about the themes yet, but it's probably pretty obvious the visuals are a reflection of the world of Felvidek. The color palette is not an accident. This is a grim and gritty portrayal of this period in history, and the graphics give it that extra oomph. Okay, so back to the game, Matei reluctantly joins Pavel as he's not thrilled to be on a mission with a drunken knight, and we're off to check on the exploding castle. Once we leave our lord's castle, we get taken straight to the overworld map, a classic in JRPGs. We can wander around a bit here, but it's best to head straight north and take care of business. On our way, we bump into some angry Hussites, which I thought at first were going to be a people of another nation, but it turns out they just believe in the teaching of this guy, Jan Hus, really hard, and we don't apparently. This conflict is so bad that the Hussites are one of the main enemies of the game popping up everywhere you don't want them to be. And I surmise from this game that it's basically a brother versus brother full on civil war. What kind of American are you? Anyway, this is a JRPG, so battle must be turn based. In this game, you have a very simple two bars to manage. The HP bar, which is probably pretty obvious by now if you've played a video game or two, and the tools bar, which replaces mana in this world, at least for you. Tools is a representation of how prepared you are, I guess and it costs tools to use your special moves called feints. Combat in this game looks pretty standard at first, but it differentiates itself from your generic JRPG in several ways. First of all, it's pretty hard. There's a real risk of getting wiped in any random encounter, so save often. Another big deviation is there's no traditional leveling system. It's really more about learning how to use the tools available to you and learning your enemies. So you can change your stats with equipments and certain rare consumable items, and equipping different weapons will give you access to different feints, so all in all, it's a combat system that rewards smart thinking and pressing whatever advantage you might have, rather than grinding and power leveling. For instance, there's a lot of enemies in this game that wear heavy armor, as you might imagine since this is the time of knights. If you're attacking these guys normally without a plan, you'll do very little damage. So you might have to consider reducing their armor with Pavel's special feint half-sorting, or equipping at least one person in your party with a mace, so that we have some crushing power, which is very effective against armor. Another thing to consider is that apparently guns were in the mix historically, and the enemies carrying these do an insane amount of damage, but are typically not heavily armored, so you probably want to prioritize them to get rid of them quickly. Anyway, the battle system feels like every encounter matters more than your standard JRPG, and each of these encounters feels more like a puzzle than just mashing attacks until everyone is dead. Okay, so on the way to the tower I actually got a bit distracted. I want to check out what's going on in 15th century life, so I spent some time in the local hamlet, another fortress and ye old tavern where I get into a brawl with a fellow drunk. It's alright though, he's a friendly guy, and after we kick his ass, he'll join our party. For a bit. Until you try to cross any bridge, and then he'll fall right off. Focus up. We gotta check out why this castle exploded. Turns out, it's cultists. Now, uh, frankly, this game's a representation of cultists that wear robes. Well, it's pretty problematic. We're not all like that. These guys are particularly nasty, and this is where the game leaves its historically grounded setting and begins to veer off into fantasy. These cultists are the real deal. They have mutated abominations running around and they successfully summon and bound a lesser entity. Anyway, this encounter with the cultists launches the main plot of the game. I don't really want to spoil anything, but there's a lot of twists and turns, which leads me into the only real criticism I have of this game. So you may have noticed in the clips going by that this game uses old fashioned English, but it doesn't stop there. It even leaves plenty of untranslated Hungarian. Now this is cool for flavor, and it definitely adds to the vibe, I'm not criticizing that. In fact, it usually bothers me if there's a specific setting and they use anachronistic language. Like, I just saw Dune 2, and they were pretty comfortable using modern day slang in a setting that's thousands of years in the future, and that bothered me. But, but there's also a limit. This game has the occasional dialogue heavy section, and I actually found myself getting a bit lost in the old language in Hungarian. Another thing I noticed is that sometimes characters refer to each other by what I think is a nickname or something? but as an outsider to the language, culture, and time, I'm not certain. Unfortunately, this confusion led me to not picking up on some important plot points, and there's actually a fairly deep plot going on here, so that's definitely not ideal. This also bleeds into the gameplay portion, as an often important conversation would resolve, and I would be clueless on where to go next or what to do next because I missed something important that I didn't pick up just from context alone. Now, this commitment to the historical setting is probably something you can make your mind up about right now, because I know there's a lot of people who will love this, and in general, I imagine this game will be sort of polarizing. Some people will probably see the unique visuals and the dialogue and be super turned off, but on the other hand, I know this will be someone's favorite game ever. I really admire this game for just being itself, but ultimately you should know, if you're dumb like me, you might have some trouble figuring out where to go. It's okay, because all that's really going to happen is you just have to run around interacting with everything to eventually progress, but it's still kind of frustrating. 
But despite what I just said, and despite having some slight difficulty with the dialogue, one of this game's strengths is the characterization. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the length of the game. It's more of an afternoon romp. You can beat the whole thing in roughly five hours, which is a fine length. I have no problem with that. But for this relatively short time, I'm very impressed with how fleshed out the characters are. Pavel and Matei especially start out kind of rubbing each other the wrong way. Pavel is just depressing spaghetti because he's got woman problems turned into alcohol problems and Matei doesn't really want to spend more time with him than he has to. But over the course of their adventures, they gain a mutual respect for each other and eventually a friendship blossoms. Everyone in the game has their tendencies and character traits that really help the world feel real. The Lord in the castle just wants to play board games all day and he's not really taking the stewardship of the kingdom super serious. Mate is a bit stuffy, but he opens up a lot during the adventure and ultimately just wants to do the right thing by God and his fellow countrymen. Pavel himself is pretty complex, wrestling with the alcoholism and grief from his wife leaving him, and also being evil. I kind of forgot to mention that, but she's one of the bad guys. And he even has a moment that really struck me when he's explaining to Mate that during the Turkish Crusades, he was literally about to be executed. The blade was on his neck, when by random fluke he was saved. And although he lives yet, he can still feel the cold steel on his skin to this very day. Which is a pretty cool explanation of PTSD a full 500-ish years before the concept gets invented. Another huge praise I have for the game is, despite being pretty short, you get into a huge amount of unique little mini-adventures during the course of the overarching story. These would probably be their own full-fledged questlines in a larger game, but for an RPG of a more modest size, I love how this game handles stuff like this. One risk of RPG Maker games is that they'll feel quite generic. Walk here, combat here, talk to this townsperson. But Felvedek completely avoids all of these pitfalls through not only the unique visuals and dialogue and setting, but also its commitment to having interesting things for you to do on your quest. I'll give you a few examples. There's one fun bit where you're in a town, in someone else's house, as you do, and you get jumped and robbed by a group of thieves. They take everything but your underwear, so you're forced to beg the burgmaster, which I guess is like the mayor, for some clothes. And he ends up lending you his trusty hound to sniff out where the perpetrators might have gone. Once you find them, you have one of those classic must-lose enemy encounters. Then the thief locks you up, and it seems like she's gonna kill you. But then the cultists break in and the thief hates them more than she hates you. So she temporarily joins your party and you have another face off with those nasty cultists. Another bit I love is there's a sequence where you have to try to figure out where these cultists are getting these beans because, oh yeah, okay. A major plot point is the cultists are using coffee to turn people into mutants. Anyway, to get this intel, you have to do some reconnaissance at a tavern, but Matei won't let Pavel drink. So they decide to swap clothes so that Matei can drink in Pavel's stead and Pavel can stay dry using the excuse that he's a monk. Anyway, turns out Matei is a bit of a lightweight and shenanigans ensue, eventually leading to Matei challenging a pretty boy knight to a duel and losing miserably. It's stuff like this that keeps the game moving. It's got real momentum, always keeping it fresh. Your party also changes a lot. Sometimes the Lord tags along, sometimes you get random army guys, or towards the end of the game, you get a pretty boy knight of your own. Now, finally, I guess we have to talk about the comparisons you might draw between this game and some other notable RPG maker darlings. Yeah, this game obviously draws pretty heavily from Hylix and Fear and Hunger, but is that a bad thing? Yes, one of my first thoughts when playing this was like, wow, Hylix and Funger had a baby. Hylix is very near and dear to my heart, since it was the game about which I made my first video ever, so I'm not against seeing Hylix inspired games, and Funger, well, I've observed from a distance. So is there anything wrong with having inspirations? Nah. Like I said, Felvidek carves out enough of its own identity. Despite the grim dark tone that it might inherit from stuff like Funger, the game is also really funny and has no problem mixing quirky stuff in from the Hylix side. The cinematics it brings to the table are also amazing and serve to kind of make it distinct from the saturated market. Although there is one element of the amazing cinematics that kind of backfired, and it's that sometimes when I'm watching them, I'm like, dang, I, I kind of wish the whole game was that and I was just playing that game. But you know, it's okay, Feather Take 2, right? Oh wait, okay, I almost got to the end without mentioning the music. Despite me almost forgetting, the music is not forgettable. It's actually fantastic. Based on the visuals alone, you might assume this game is gonna have a bunch of depressing, dreary tracks, but not so. There's a lot to like here, like this banger that plays in the tavern. Or the battle theme. even just the main title theme.
to me, a lot of this stuff could easily be at home on a prog rock album, almost like a Lost King Crimson album or something. Anyway, it's really good, which is a pleasant surprise, but a most welcome one. All right, time to wrap it up. I've tried to keep this as spoiler free as possible because I want you to experience it for yourself. Like I said earlier, you probably already have a good idea if you'd be interested in this game or not, but it's very unique. So if you're on the fence, maybe give it a try. I haven't played anything exactly like this before and I appreciate that this game exists. I enjoy the game a lot and I appreciate the devs for making something that's kind of out there. And I also appreciate you if you're still watching. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Doom Profit out. <laughs>